hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Mm. Mm. My, if you only knew how much God wanted to bless his people. But so many times he can't bless us the way he wants to because we're so self-focused and it's all about what we want. God says you start you start, start focusing on somebody else besides yourself and just wait and see what I'll do for you. God told us last week that the rain could not come without the fire first and the fire could not come without an altar being built of, mm, woo, of unity. The 12 stones Elijah took and he built that altar. God was making a statement. I never chose you to be 10 and two tribes, Israel and Judah. You were always supposed to have been one. God's trying to tell New Haven Church and every church in this country, it's time to become united. Because when you unite, you rebuild that altar where that you don't accept sin and you don't play around and you say, dear God, as long as I have that altar in front of me, I'm reminded of sacrifice and that this life isn't always fun, but it's worth it. And if I'll build that altar in unity and obedience, then you will send the fire. And when you do, rain is sure to come thereafter. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain on the United States of America. Satan thinks he has taken us almost to a point of complete deception. He thinks he has gotten control of Washington, D.C. to a place where that all they're going to be consumed with now is liberal mindset. And they're going to enforce their ways upon the conservatives of the nation. I'm not even talking about a, a party. I'm talking about a people who love God and they're willing to obey the word. But the enemy will lose. Every time it seems like that nations have got to a point of utter spiritual destruction, God has ignited a revival. God's got a hold of some adults and some young people who said, although I'm saturated in media and I'm saturated in life with every type of perversion and lust and greed and selfishness, Yet God put a heart in me after his own and I can't settle for second best. I've got to have God. I've got to have holiness. I've got to have righteousness. I need real love. I don't want this sex junk where it doesn't fulfill my need. I want the real love of God that touches my deepest soul. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. Turn up his mic, back. Right now. Abundance, abundance, abundance of rain. God, we hear your sound. We hear the sound of your abundance of rain coming down upon us right now. An abundance of rain. Jesus, God, open the floodgates of heaven. Right here, Lord, in Southside. Let it rain, let it rain, open the floodgates of Open up the door with your praise. God, open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Let it pour. Jesus, 
Jesus, we're asking you to open, open the floodgates of heaven. If he can just find a people who will bypass their own desires, if he can only find a people who will ignore the passions of the flesh that desire to do things contrary to the will of the Spirit, if God can only find a people whose heart will be after his own, then those are the ones that he will pour out his Spirit upon. You think you've seen the windows of heaven open in the past? Wait until you start obeying his word with your complete self and watch God shake your family watch him shake your body watch him shake your soul if a people will submit themselves to almighty God he will do wonders God's talking to some families brother Gary right now my household perhaps has not been honorable to the Lord you say we've not done everything we were supposed to do we haven't been faithful in all the things you ask of us God but I feel a compelling in my soul today our family is going to make a turn oh my Lord I feel the Holy Ghost today is a day where Lord God I can't go through church like I used to I can't show up and play the game and look the part Lord God I'm not satisfied just to be saved anymore I need your glory I need your supernatural joy I need peace that passes all understanding and Lord God today as a family we make a covenant we're stepping into a new realm of obedience to your word. We'll pay tithes. We'll be faithful to the house of the Lord. We'll worship you as a family. We'll have devotions in the home where that the daddy opens the Bible himself. And when the father of the house reads the holy word, it will impact his children for the rest of their lives. That's what an abundance of rain will do for you. Dear God, we ask for your will to be done. We ask, oh God, that you be in control and that whatever you want to say, Lord, you realize we are open to hear. God, the door is swung wide today and your presence is here and you've allowed us to set the stage through our worship for the people to hear the word for the hour. And oh, dear God, Please, please don't let this be a word, Lord, that people just take it and they forget about it. Lord, I pray it will become ingrained in their very being and that when they hear these words of promise, they'll understand it's for them and that there's a job they must do in order to see the completion of this. I commit myself to you. I ask, Spirit of God, you take over me and you speak to your people through my vessel. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated if you would like. Stand if you'd like. Twist and shout as long as you're doing it for Jesus. <laughs> it won't bother me. We're here to praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords. An abundance of rain. Last Sunday, I began this message and wasn't able to complete it. This morning, I've got some very, very crucial things I need to share with the church. We will begin where we had left off with verse 36 from 1 Kings 18, and you're welcome to read with me on the screens. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. We know Israel to be a new name that was given to Jacob. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. I was talking with, uh, it seemed like it was Colton yesterday. It might have been, it might have been when I was with Ben and Stu, but I remember we talked about the uh, golden elephant. Was that us? Th that they had um, dealt with someone who had a golden elephant and I said, what, what was that, an idol? And was, how tall? Ten feet tall, made out of gold. And I remember saying to them in the, the truck when we were on the road, I said, I would hate to know that I served a God who could not impact my life, that could not hear me and could not talk back to me. And what a sad existence. And yet we look 
at the nation of Israel, and we see they had a problem with this temptation, a temptation called idolatry. And so <clears throat> we see here that in the middle of Elijah building an altar out of 12 stones, and, and he's about to pray unto God, and as we've read here, he began his prayer. And I asked this question, who wouldn't want a God you could touch? I mean, think about that. It, it makes sense, doesn't it? If I'm going to serve a God, if I'm going to go get my buddies and say, hey, I'm going to take you over to this building so I can show you the God that I serve. Wouldn't that be awesome to allow them to walk up and touch your God? I mean, that'd be amazing. And you can see a little bit how it was tempting to Israel to form a God that could be touched by their hands. But see, the problem was that as much as they touched that idol, it could never touch them. You ask, well, what about God? I would like to touch him sometime. Well, for 33 and a half years, he allowed that. He allowed Mary, a precious virgin woman who loved the Lord and was righteous in God's sight, to be, as far as I know, the first one to touch Jesus. His daddy, the earthly father, Joseph, touched Jesus. There was many people along the way of his life that it even tells stories over and over. If you look up the word touch in your concordance, you'll see that many times it's involving Christ because he loved to touch the people. So we have a God who cannot just be touched through our prayers, but he loves to touch us. I want to ask you a few questions today. If you could make a God of your own, what would he look like? How big would he or she be? What would be the form of your God? Because I may surprise you with this next statement, but believe it or not, somewhere in the time since you were born until now, there was some things formed in your life that was not God, but we put it before God. So I ask you the question, what did those things consist of? The things that for a short time you may have put as more important than serving the Most High God. What did that idol look like in our lives? And when we begin to see how easy it is to put things before God, sometimes it's easier to relate to these people, even though they formed a physical God. As Elijah prepared his sacrifice, the people drew near. He was attempting to lead them back to a God of Israel, who was invisible to the human eye, who could not be touched by hands, and who demanded a high moral standard. Now, if you had a God who would allow you to go sleep with anybody you wanted, go get, uh, uh, trying to say drugs and alcohol at the exact same time, get drunk on alcohol and get high on drugs, how many people would go along with that? See, Baal was that type of God. He'd let you do practically whatever you wanted as long as you brought uh, the sacrifices to Baal. And I'm, I'm of course, Baal didn't have an opinion because he didn't exist, but the people made up their own religion about him. And here's Elijah trying to tell the people, but come follow with me because I've got a God who demands holiness. I've got a God you can't touch, a God you can't see. And so you can imagine what a tough sale that was for the prophet of God. But something was about to happen that would forever change the nation of Israel, or at least these people who were at this little convention they were having. Hear me, verse 37 says, as Elijah prays, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. What an, a very pivotal thing we need to look at here. Elijah's trying to share with the people of Israel, this isn't just about me gaining my reputation as a prophet. It's not so I can go hang out in the palace again and I can become a well-known, my posters put up all over Israel. He said, no, it's about the hearts of every one of you in this congregation. It's about the hearts of men, women, boys, girls to the youngest age who can understand about, about righteousness and about God. He was asking God to turn back the hearts of the people. As the people stood in their big crowd and they listened to the prayer of Elijah, some of them could have looked over at the worshipers of Baal and they saw people who were exhausted. They'd just spent over half a day trying to get their God to send fire down from heaven. Bible says they even took sharp objects and cut their skin until it bled all over them. So there were probably people passed out that uh, the crowd looked at and thought, is that really what I want to follow? I've got folks over here who have no answer. They have no hope. 
There is no love in what they teach us. There's nothing about joy. It's, all it is is please the flesh. Do what you feel like. Don't care about anybody else. And so even though that it looked like it could be a hard to sell this Jehovah God to a congregation. Elijah let the prophets of Baal go first because he was wanting the crowd to see there is no hope in what these people offer you. Verse 38, after the prayer of Elijah, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Anybody want to go somewhere with me for just a minute? You don't have to leave your seat to go with me. It's kind of like when you go to Disney World and they got those rides where the entire room, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but the entire room is a dinosaur ride. I think it was Epcot. And the whole crowd starts moving. And I'm like, hey, that's nice. I don't have to walk. I just get tired of walking all over the park, amen. And, and on this trip, they take the entire crowd through the, the dinosaur ride. That was kind of fun. Well, we're about to go on a little ride here because Together, we're going to see that one of the things God showed us when he sent the fire was, I am going to deal with stagnant water. Mm. Uh-oh, look out. How many people going through a famine would like to see 12 pitchers of water, or actually it was four pitchers three different times, brought to a sacrifice, dumped all over this dead animal in, the, in these trenches, and the whole time you're thinking, man, mama could wash my clothes with that. You got... A mother over here thinking, boy, I, sh I could sure use that water to cook a good stew. And here we are in the middle of a famine. And, and you got daddies who are thinking, mama gets on to me every time I walk in the house. My wife does because I won't clean my hands. But we have no water because we're in the middle of a famine. So you've got a crowd watching these prophets of Baal walk with these big jugs of water. And they're desiring what's in the nasty jars. They're so starved for some kind of water, they would be willing to drink even from those old dusty, nasty jars. But see, when God sends the fire, it's to show us that before I can send the, oh, hallelujah, before I can send Southside, Alabama, and Etowah County, the latter-day abundance of rain, I need to consume some stagnant water in, oh, I feel the Lord coming on me now. I've got a deal with some stagnant water in the people of my church. Uh, they've depended on some water pots that are so nasty that if they could compare it to the, the abundant water that comes forth from the fountain of God, they would look and say, how could I ever drink this mess? Pastor, what kind of stuff are you talking about? That stagnant water. Well, there's some things such as jealousy in ministry. Oh, could we go there? It ain't got time. There's some stagnant water that we call traditions. Some traditions are good. Some traditions need to be flushed down the toilet with a plunger behind it to make sure it does not come back. Amen. There's some traditions people can consider more important than the word of God. I'm not talking about praying, reading the Bible. You got to do that stuff. But there's some tradition. I remember there used to be traditions where that if you didn't wear your sleeves all the way, I'm talking about for men, all the way to your wrist. Oh my goodness, I see the pastor's watch. Woo, we're gonna have to pray for him. If the sleeve didn't go all the way down to the wrist, he was not a holy person. I remember a time, and I'm not putting down my dad. I love him and he did what he did in honor of the Lord. But let me just say this. I remember a time where even he and and his whole generation of Church of God people would not wear this right here, a wedding ring. Again, I'm not speaking against him because he was doing it in what he felt was obedience to the Lord. But what I'm saying, that generation brought their people under bondage because they, I mean, this right here, I love wearing this. It lets those women know, don't you look at him. Don't you check him out. My wife says when I'm playing the drums, well, I ain't gonna say exactly what she said. <laughs> I'm playing them drums. She's like, mm, mm Sometimes I'll get up preaching. Holy Ghost starts moving. She's like, oh, you are so fine. <laughs> I'll wear this ring so no, one, no other woman will lust. Amen. Or look at me and say, I wonder if he's available. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is a wonderful blessing. It shows I have made a vow in the sight of God and I'm not available. When you wear your wedding ring, it's not something of bondage. It's not something to be ashamed of or to say, oh, I'm not holy enough because I wear this. I, I, I know I'm kind of picking on the wedding rings, but there are so many traditions. 
that we get hung up on. Man, you let some so-called prophet of God come through town and they'll say something to you that sounds spiritual and it's not Bible-based whatsoever and we want to start a whole church on it. That's garbage. We get caught up in traditions. We get caught up in what somebody says and, and I, as a pastor, tend to upset people because I'll have folks come at me with crazy stuff and I'll say, but what does the Bible say? If it doesn't line up with the Bible, I know you're all excited. And I know you want to go get you a bus tour and sell your CDs and go on TV and preach this. But if the Bible doesn't say it, then I wouldn't preach it. Amen. Right. Amen. Now, what about, Pastor, when you talk about DVD players in the back of the wagon leaving from Egypt? Well, you just have to overlook that stuff. <laughs> I, I like adding a little color. But I don't preach it as the gospel. Amen. I like, I like getting a little crazy sometimes. Throw a little Mater's pizza in the middle of Exodus. Oh, hallelujah. Uh-oh, got some shout. I, I, I got somebody with me today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Maters, we must be careful that what we speak, what we teach, what we preach, what we share as truth is founded on the word of God. So what did God do? Before he sent the abundant supply of rain, he dealt with the stagnant water. What's some other? Oh, y'all want me to go a little farther? Oh, Brother, I feel like there's another pot of stagnant water I need to at least talk about. Bad attitudes. You let the Holy Ghost move and somebody will be like, wow, glory to God. You know, I mean, they're the loudest shouter in the whole building. But then you start dealing with them in regular life. You show up where they work and they're like, I hate my job. Can't stand my employer. I wish the people that I work with would just drop off the earth. I mean, you know, they got bad attitudes. It's weird. And you're thinking, wait a minute. You just shouted the house down, knocked about three chairs over before Neil ran by you. And, <laughs> and now, right, right now today, I, I've, I've come across you at Walmart, and we're on the aisle with the Tide bleach, and we're talking about, uh, you know, I need this particular color bleach and stuff. And all of a sudden, you just go to griping about something. Bad attitude. You know what that's called? Stagnant water. We've got to be careful about that stuff. An unwillingness to show compassion. Mm. One thing that's going to springboard New Haven and any other church that will do this into God's blessings is when you start showing compassion to people around you. Well, Pastor, I send $20 a month to this little kid in Haiti. I've got the picture, and she's got the cute little hairdo, and, and I make sure she's got food. Praise God for that. But what about the people in your own neighborhood? What about the people in your own church? Well, Pastor, I can bless some kid in Haiti, but I can't stand the kids at New Haven. I know you ain't talking about Rotha Giant. If you're a visitor, that's my daughter. So. I mean, isn't it something? Bad attitudes and, and lack of compassion, how that can cause the water that was so fresh when God originally established a church, how it can cause a church to become like stagnant water. But praise God, your pastor hears the sound of an abundance of rain. Oh, hallelujah. Believing a particular church has a monopoly on the move of God is stagnant water. Oh, you all got to come to our church. It ain't happening nowhere else but our church. God's speaking just through our pastor. This is all about uh, New Haven. Ain't nobody else getting blessed. Nobody's getting filled with the Spirit. No. That's called thinking you got a monopoly on the move of God, and it's unbiblical, unscriptural. It's not of God. You need to get your heart right. Amen? God wants to move everywhere in every church. That's his will. Ephesians 4, 30 and 32 deals with stagnant water in our lives. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind. Look at your neighbor and say, be kind. And then look at another neighbor and say, you be kind yourself. <laughs> he said, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. There's the trump card. I always got to bring that up. When I have problems with somebody, I just want to slap them in their little soft face. I have to see the cross of Calvary and be reminded I deserve to burn forever in hell because I offended God with my sins. And he forgave me, so therefore, there's no way I'm going to hold a grudge against somebody else. 
Amen. I'm going to get past it. I'm going to love them. Let's go back to our story. We're going to try to finish here. First Kings 18 verse 39. What happened when the people saw this? When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. I want you to say that with me three times. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The famine that some of you have been going through is going to be an opportunity for those around you to have revelation of who God is. That was a mouthful. But what you're facing, what you're dealing with, that time of dryness, that dry spell, you hadn't been getting all your prayers answered. There's been things you've thought God should have done sooner, but he hasn't. It's because he's using that moment of suffering, moment of waiting, to bring about a revelation in the people around you of who he is. Amazing, amazing word that God's sharing. What did Elijah do? Well, it's kind of funny because, you know, we would have thought, well, let's just all get around the campfire that came down from heaven and let's sing Kumbaya. We're going to roast some uh, marshmallows and have the, uh, now here I'm about to get unbiblical. We're going to have the first s'mores party ever. <laughs> they didn't say that. But instead of everybody getting along, look what Elijah did. Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Then Elijah said to Ahab, oh, Lord, I feel the Spirit coming on me. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of an abundance of rain. When it comes to the demonic realm, we do not sit around the campfire and just get along with every offensive behavior. It's going to be tempting in these last days to say, well, let's just talk about God and leave out the name. Jesus, I'm about to preach. You better watch out, Brittany. Let's make sure everybody's comfortable when we get the opportunity to go and speak at our schools, Colton, and speak at different groups. But here's the thing. If you shut me down from speaking the name of Jesus, you're shutting down access to the only power that will set schools free from drug addiction, sexual promiscuity, and all other types of things. If, if we are going to infiltrate the kingdom of the devil, it will not come by getting along with demons and compromising the gospel. We must speak the truth as if we're the very last ones who will ever speak the gospel before Jesus comes. This is not a generation of compromise. It's a generation. I feel the Holy Ghost. It's a generation of power. That's why we need the baptism of the Holy Ghost like we never needed it before because God's about to speak a dynamic word that will set your families free. Your mamas and your daddies are going to be set free from addiction. Your sons and your daughters are going to come out of the dark world and, and God's going to set them free why because I speak to a world and a nation and a generation and a city and a church who will not settle for what the world says they must I speak to a nation and a generation that will accept the responsibility that when it is not fun we'll preach truth when it does not feel good we'll speak what's right when it does not seem to please my friends I'll still live holy and tell them what will set them free we don't need another counseling session. We need a move of the Holy Ghost. I don't need more medicine to mess up my mind and cause me to get calm. I need a move of the Holy Ghost. Medicine won't get rid of your suicidal thoughts. Jesus Christ will do it. Now, if you're a guest here, you're going to be thinking, well, he's against all medicine. Folks, I'm on medicine right now. Can't you tell? <laughs> That's right. I've been taking some antibiotics. If I was against medicine, I wouldn't take it. But I'm here to tell you, when you depend on something to alter your life and to control your little temper that you need to get under the blood of Jesus instead of asking a doctor, help me with this. I can't stop losing control. I need some kind of medicine. No, you don't need medicine. You need to get in an altar and say, dear God, I crucify that flesh. Lord, when that anger starts boiling up in me, I'll start speaking your word that you gave me peace that passes all understanding. Woo! Woo! Well, I didn't know I was going here today. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. You must be able to hear the drops before you ever see the water dripping from the heavens. See, our ears must become attentive. Faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the word of God. Guess who had a word from God? Elijah had a word before he ever showed up at the showdown at the Mount Carmel Corral. Before he showed up there, he had a word. Elijah, go do what I say because when you obey me, I am going to send a rain upon this nation. You know why you can't hold back teenagers when it comes to God wanting to move through you? Because God has already promised if you'll rise up above sin, above that lust, when you walk through the mall and Victoria's Secret's flashing everything she's got at you about 10 feet tall, if you'll overcome that junk on your cell phone when you're tempted to run down half your, fr- or half your enemies and talk about how awful they are and you say, no, wait a minute, instead of cursing them, I'm going to bless them. When you as a generation begin to rise up, take your right place as the last day's generation filled with the Holy Ghost you will see an abundance of rain Woo! Lord Jesus it's Sunday morning and we're still having church Woo! <laughs> that's the way it's going to be amen so we look here and I'm trying to finish now go to 1 Kings 18 42 So Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and then he bowed down on the ground, put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, man, I know he hated to come back with this message. Elijah, I know what you've told us. Brother, I was there when the fire came down from heaven. I saw the sacrifice consume but I'm afraid I've got a bad report. I don't see anything. So Elijah prays and he says, go back and look again. Second, third, fourth. He continues to look fifth, sixth time. You've heard me preach this before if you've been here for a while. Sixth time, by this time he's so embarrassed he doesn't know how he's gonna keep going back to Elijah. Elijah, I know you've prayed. I know that we've seen God move in the past. Oh, I'm talking to somebody right now. I know we've had our good worship services. Uh, Elijah, I know we've seen God absolutely transform lives. But Elijah, there's nothing that I can report to you. The Bible says that Elijah got down and put his face between his knees. He sought the Lord. He kept praying until... And on the seventh time, he went and looked. And and go to that next scripture, please, on the screen. He said, there is a cloud. Now, if I had been the servant, I would have ran back to Elijah. I mean, after six trips, you'd think you're tired, but on the seventh time, when you see a manifestation of the word that God gave the prophet, then something inside you kicks in, adrenaline starts rushing higher than Red Bull or Mountain Dew or anything else, and you start flying with a word. Uh, A prophet of God, there is a cloud. And he said it's as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. What happened after that? Elijah sent him, told him to give a message to the king because the rain's going to come so fast he won't even be able to see to drive his chariot. You better hurry, he was telling him. The message for the hour, you've got to rebuild the altar of unity. You've got to get back to your foundations. You've got to start getting on, uh, based on Christian principles, not on what you think, not on what you hear. It's got to be biblically based. You've got to invite the Lord to send the fire so that he can um, uh, evaporate the stagnant water in your life. And once you obey God, he is going to send an abundance of rain. Verse 45. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind. And there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. What are we supposed to do as a church? I'm about to ask Brother Gary Wilson to come up here. This Wednesday night, we're having a church business meeting. The deacons have met. We've sought the Lord. There are some things that God has shown us we are to do in this community right now. And we're going to come before you believing you're going to be in unity with us. We're about to go into City Hall. We're about to start blessing people who don't even know that we, well, some of them probably know we're here, but a lot of them do not know our names. And if you'll get with us, we're going to bless the people who work for this community. 
firemen, policemen, rescue teams. We're going to go in and let them know we love them, we're praying for them, God loves them, and we're going to give them a gift. If you'll get with us, and I know you will, we're going to start a, a, a work where that, uh, with the help of uh, this information coming from City Hall or the fire department, we want to adopt a family. I'd like to get to a place where we can do it at least once a month. We start pouring into one family every month that is in need in the South Side area. They don't have groceries. Maybe they're needing help. In whatever way it is, we're going to try to see what we can do to help our community. You want an abundance of rain? Start showing compassion to somebody else. Amen.